Okay, so this is a video on Dollar General. And part of the part of the thing that got me into this, and I'm gonna come back to it in my uh, Excel spreadsheet here. Uh, part of what got me interested in Dollar General is uh, the gross margins. As you can see here, they're pretty healthy. Anything over 30%, I'd say would be pretty good. Uh, this is before you adjust for uh, some of the stuff that they've been doing to their financial statements over the past couple years. Now, I will say Dollar General is becoming very cheap. Well, I won't say very cheap. I'll, I'll take that back. But cheaper than it has been. Right now, it's trading an EBIT, EBIT of 13.4 and EBIT free cash flow of 15.2. So if you're going to take the earnings yield method and just do inverse of EV to EBIT, which is usually what I do, it's trading at 7.46% earnings yield um, on top of... 6.57% free cash flow yield. So it's getting it's getting pretty attractive. It's getting pretty attractive in terms of the valuation uh, perspective. Now that's not the be all end all, but um, it should be uh, something uh, to look at and uh, keep you uh, interested in the stock because now it's it's arguably becoming cheaper, but for good reason, I think. Um, I, I don't think that they deserve as high a valuation as they've been getting in these current market conditions. Now, on this spreadsheet, I have uh, the numbers from their annual reports from 2012 to 2020. And what I want to highlight here, um, a few things. Okay, So I actually cover Dollar General on my Substack. Um, I, I, I'm a quicker writer than I am a video maker. And uh, the Substack's free, don't worry. Um, I actually cover it in greater detail there. And some of the things that I want to cover are there are... Uh, more uh, granular in nature on that Substack article. I'm going to link it to the bottom uh, for those of you that might be interested in that sort of thing. Um, and can e and you guys can easily reference a, a, a written article much quicker than uh, much quicker than a video. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the surface level stuff here that I think is interesting. Now, from 2012 to 2020, you've seen the expansion of their net long term debt. Okay. Their total liabilities have increased 15.7%, and 15.49% of this 15.7% has been long-term debt. Now that's nothing new, okay? Because most of it's most of this is leases. So okay, fine, understood. Now moving down, that increase in total liabilities has shown up in their capital base. Their ca I'm calculating their capital employed as net long-term debt plus their equity, total equity, book value, if you will, um, plus total deferred taxes. So this is me adding deferred income taxes from the assets and liability side of the balance sheet together. That's why I'm getting a large number. Um, just to be very clear as to how I'm looking at this. And because this functions like an equity item, I'm going to add that back into the total capital employed calculation. So because of that, I get a 10.88% growth in the capital base. This is important, okay? So why that matters is that the company's taking on more capital to do exactly what they've always been doing, multi-line retail. They just open stores where they offer products for very, very thin margins, and that's what they've been doing forever. They need more capital to do exactly what they've been doing from 2012 to today. So why? Why do they need more capital to do it? Well, there's actually a good answer. Um, they're expanding aggressively. Dollar General so far has about 16,000 odd locations and they want to continue growing at a very rapid rate. Now, I cover more of why and how they do that in the Substack article. But the, the growth is showing on the capital, uh, in the capital based on their balance sheet. So this is not that much of a surprise that that's the case. But when you see a capital, when you see capital based growth, you need to know why they're doing it. And is it going to benefit the company? Because that's shareholder money, you know, your money helping them out. And um, most people don't think in terms of growth of the capital base uh, from what I've been able to gather. 
as to how people look at companies. They don't really pay attention to growth of the capital base, but I think that's very, very important to see. Now, the capital base has grown 10.88% over these, over these years, but gross profits has only grown 7.68%. Net revenues have only grown 8%. So the capital base has grown faster than these revenues have been able to catch up with. Operating income has only grown 5.58%. And net income has only grown 10.57%. So the capital base has grown faster than their revenue streams. And and some of that growth has translated to larger net income, uh, growth in net income, but not all of it. What I want to see is this be 10.88%, but net income grow 12% or 13%. I don't want the capital base to outpace the growth of net income or free cash flow. And which leads me to my next point, free cash flow has actually increased faster than the capital uh, employed, uh, the capital base. Now, this is before I adjust for all the, some, uh, all the uh, financial stuff that they've been doing. Nothing onerous. Um, but you still have to account for one, uh, one time expenses, not cash items, so on and so forth. So this is just, I guess what you could call reported, uh, free cash flow. I'm calculating that very simply CFFO minus CapEx. So just so that you know how I'm looking at this, I'm not making this complicated or complex. It's already complicated enough. Um, but before I adjust for anything, it looks pretty promising. Uh, free cash flow has grown 13.29%. And that's what you want. You want free cash flow to outpace the growth of the capital base for the reasons I mentioned of like not even a minute ago. But I will say, and this is where my problem area is, despite all that growth, some of the key metrics that I'm looking at now are not as appealing as I'd like them to be. Gross profit to tangible assets, which is something that you want to look at as an investor, has been dropping rather precipitously gross margins and ebit margins operating profit margins when i say ebit margins that is what i mean have been dropping slowly but surely that's a bit of a problem now dollar general focuses on being a part grocer part retailer to people in rural areas so a lot of their stuff a lot of their merchandise is very low margin deliberately, and they tend to be serving low margin products because they're in the grocery business. They want to expand it more into the grocery business to serve the, to better serve the rural area that they're in. Now, I'll show you here again, gross profit margins from 32% all the way down to 30.6%. Okay, fine. If they want to jump into the grocery store game, then that means they're going to have to compete with Kroger, uh, Ingles, uh, uh, Sprouts to a point, although they do something more niche in the grocery business. Uh, Walmart, definitely Walmart, and other uh, grocery stores. Now, the problem with that is their margins are low. You go from 30.6% to 22 odd percent, the lowest here being 20.6. So part of my fear is where is Dollar General going? I think they're going to be dropping into lower margin territory. And I cover some of the potential pitfalls for that for investors like me and you hopefully watching this. Um, I cover the rest of that in more granular detail on my Substack page. Again, it's free um, to subscribe. You just put in your email and you'll get an email once a week on a business that I've been reading up on um, and finding some of the interesting things in there. Um, I'll leave the link for that uh, in the description box below. Um, If you like this kind of content, please subscribe uh, to the channel. Um, uh, Comment, criticize. uh, leave constructive feedback in the comments below. I'll do my best to get back to everybody as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, take care.